Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Johnston. I am the ESA's uh, Education Programs Coordinator, and I am happy to bring you to our fourth and final 4DEE water cooler chat series that we started earlier this spring. I can't believe it's already almost summer. So today we're going to be discussing bringing 4DEE to TIE or TIEE, -E, a case study. Um, we are going to be recording this chat today. So if you don't want your uh, face or name on the recording, please go ahead and feel free to change your name by clicking on the three dots in the top right hand corner of your um, camera. And also um, you, you can turn your video off. Okay, with that being said, uh, please share your name, your affiliation. This is an informal chat. We're really excited to have you here. Um, if you haven't done the water cooler process before, it's an informal discussion. We really welcome all ideas and experiences. The guest hosts are purely just there to create some conversation for you. Um, if you want to contribute to the conversation, you can do this one of two, two ways. You uh, can raise your little participant hand um, or you could also unmute yourself. We just ask that like you keep yourself muted until the host uh, calls on you and you're welcome to have cross conversation in the chat at any time. As a reminder, I've already said this once, but just to remind you again, we are recording this event. So before I introduce the guest host, I did wanna let everybody know about some upcoming education events. One, and I think most important, because this is the topic of 4DEE, we are currently seeking nominations for the 4DE subcommittee. And I will share a link in the chat in just a moment um, for that, but the nominations are due June 18th. You can nominate yourself or you can nominate somebody else. Also, we have an upcoming event um, that's not ESA, or, but it is, we are one of their sponsors and it's called, it's from the Society of Preservation Natural History or spinach, um, and it's a free education demo camp that's going to be on June 28th and 29th, and there will be some 4DEE events there. Um, then there are two other events, and then I'm going to, I promise I'll kick it over to the guest host and introduce them. Um, REEFS, which is Resources for Ecology, Education, Chair, and FAIR, is accepting presenter abstracts, and the abstracts are due on the 23rd. This is a all presenters at any stage of your, uh, your lesson plan is welcome. And it's held during the ESA's annual meeting. Um, and finally, but not least, is the Life Discovery Science, Doing Science Education Conference, which is actually gonna be an in-person conference. I know, wild to think that we're gonna do one, but we're gonna be hosting it in Estes Park, Colorado. And we are accepting abstracts for that as well for their education chair fair. And that's open and still filled. Um, and you can register for that today. And I even see, I thought Phil in the crowd, Phil Gibson, he's on the committee for the LDC. So promote for me, Phil. Okay. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the host. So I'm gonna start off with George Mittendorf. Many of you probably already know him by now, but George, a very recently retired from Howard University and is also a co-PI for um, Includes Ecology Pro Plus program. But more importantly, he's the current chair of the 4DE subcommittee. Um, also joining us today is Christopher Beck, and he is a professor of pedagogy in the Department of Biology at Emory University, where he teaches ecology lecture and lab courses. He's the past chair of the education section at ESA and serves as the lead editor for TIE. And then um, last but not least is Mark Mitchell. Mark is an ecosystem ecologist who received his PhD from the University of Cincinnati where he studied ecosystem development and nutrient dynamics of green vegetated roof ecosystems. He's taught biology, ecology, environmental science courses for two years as an assistant professor uh, before uh, going to move to his ORISE postdoc postdoctoral research position with US EPA. Okay, so that's it for me. Welcome gentlemen, and I'm going to stop screen sharing and let you all take over the show. Thank you, Jessica. Really appreciate the introductions. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here on a Friday afternoon. Um, I am, as I don't know if you're looking at my Zoom screen right now, but if you are, you'll see that I indeed am recently retired. All those boxes contain stuff that I've excavated from my office um, and moved home. My wife 
allowed me to bring anything I wanted home from my office and lab as long as it stayed in my home office. And that's why the boxes are piled up about seven feet tall now. Um, so um, it's really an interesting moment in life to be retired, I tell you. Um, I wasn't looking forward to going back on campus after a year and a half away. So I thought it was a perfect timing. Anyway, I'm here not to talk about that, but I'm here to talk about 4DEE. -E. And most of you are probably totally familiar with this, but let me just bore you for a few moments before I introduce Chris, um, who will talk about Thai. So the framework, the 4DEE -E framework was inspired oh, about 35 years ago by Paul Risser, who in a, um, his uh, presidential address um, urged the society to develop an eco-literacy framework of concepts, skills, and, and integrated learning outcomes that would guide uh, undergraduate education in the field of ecology. And over a period of years, uh, a number of people, including Ken Klimo, um, Alan Berkowitz, uh, and many, many others, um, developed um, ideas and concepts and a kind of an approach to the what became the 4DEE -E approach. And so um, there was a task force that came out of the diversity committee um, and they put together a, a conceptual framework and a proposal and submitted it to the ESA governing board, which adopted this framework um, in 2018. The framework consists of a, a, a number of topics um, moved and, and along four dimensions. The four dimensions are core ecological concepts, which essentially is this hierarchy of concepts that, we, that everybody has presented in textbooks um, since uh, Odom's initial ecology textbook. Um, the second dimension is what we call eco ecology practices, which are essentially the approaches and methodology used in doing ecology. And that includes natural history, field work, quantitative reasoning, computational thinking, designing, um, investigations, collaboration. The third dimension is the human environment interaction. And here we're looking at issues of dependence on the environment, human accelerated environmental change, how humans can use ecological systems to shape and manage resources and ecosystems, um, and the ethical dimensions um, of applying ecology in solving problems and dealing with policy. And the last dimension is the cross-cutting themes that include structure and function, pathways, transformations of matter and energy, the kind of things that apply from one discipline to another discipline. And, and basically all four um, disciplines taken together um, involve a, a conceptual reforming of how we teach ecology. And it emphasizes the integration across these dimensions during instruction and assessment to create um, what we like to think of as a multi-dimensional learning experience for students. Um, and over the last uh, couple of years, um, I've chaired the 4DEE -E subcommittee, which is a subcommittee of the CDE, and it soon will become its own committee because ESA is restructuring. And um, there are now working groups in the areas of um, media, um, non-majors, and assessment. And um, we're looking for uh, individuals who are interested in using 4DE in developing 4DE um, and applying it in the classroom. So if you have any interest in participating in 4DEE exercises or activities or with ESA, please, I'll put my name in the, uh, the chat later as soon as I start stop talking. Um, please get in touch with me or uh, Luana Prevost, who's at in Florida, um, who's the upcoming chair for the um, committee. Um, drop us your name. Um, we're looking for new um, new blood. We're looking for people who are interested in um, participating in the group. And I see a number of you here that I know would make really good, um, fresh, and bring fresh ideas. Um, and I'm looking forward to stepping off. Um, so we need to replace me. Um, but over the last year or so, we've looked at, at, at opportunities to apply for DEE. And it's, this is, a, it's, Conceptually, it's a little difficult because we're asking you not just to teach 
uh, students to memorize stuff and not to teach students how to do something, but how to do something that involves concepts or how to do something that applies to policy or how to do something that relates to their um, their own human environment and their in, in, environmental interaction. And I, for a couple of years, have used my um, the, the activity that Charlie Nylon and I developed back in the early aughts, which we call the, the Crosstown Walk. And um, we take students out and we just have walk across town and we look at how the environment changes as you move from on campus to off campus to further off campus. And for any of you who are um, teaching on a campus, you know that the environment does change rather remarkably as you go, as you run a transect away from campus in almost any direction. And so what Charlie and I did was we um, codified this and we wrote it up um, back in 2005 as, a, as a, uh, an exercise so that other people could use it. And it was written up and it's in the Thai um, library now. And when we started doing the 4DEE, work, I started to think about how to modify that, um, that exercise. And I had over the years brought in a little bit more human environment interaction um, to the process. And I thought that, you know, there are a lot of other exercises that people have done historically and written up and that are kind of classic exercises, um, the cemetery exercise, the lichens um, as you move from inner city to the, the suburbs. These are just kind of classic exercises that a lot of people use in, their in, in teaching and how can they then be related to 4DEE? How can you integrate them into these other dimensions? And it occurred to me that um, I should go back and look at the the, the latest Thai stuff and see what was going on. And I did, and I came across this really cool exercise that Mark Mitchell wrote up um, on lawns. And I thought, wow, this is great, but it didn't have any 4DEE. -E. It was um, unidimensional, dare I say, or maybe bi-dimensional, I don't know, but it didn't have the whole sh schmear. So I got in touch with Chris Beck and I asked Chris, could, could we go back and look at some of the Thai stuff? And maybe could that be, reformulated and could we bring new people in to, to work on some of these exercises that have been around for 20 years um, to kind of revamp and bring them into the 4DEE um, system. And so Chris thought that was an intriguing idea. Um, he got in touch with Mark and we decided um, to do this afternoon's um, workshop and uh, the water cooler, sorry, not a workshop, the water cooler and what, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, who's gonna tell you a little bit more about Thai. And then we're gonna turn that over to Mark, who's gonna tell us all about the exercise and figure out how to make it 4DEE. -E. So Chris, it's all yours now. All right, thanks, George. Um, so hopefully most of you are familiar with Thai or um, uh, uh, teaching issues and experiments in ecology. Um, I know Bruce Grant is here, so I want to acknowledge Bruce as one of the founders of TIE. Um, and um, to quickly share my screen with you. So if you've not ever been to the TIE website, right here, here it is, right? Just TIE.ESA.org. Um, and on the Thai website, there are sort of three main types of resources that you'll find. Um, there are activities that relate to data sets. So these are, are um, often published data sets that are associated with research articles. Um, there are figure sets, so figures from published papers, um, and then experiments. And the experiments can either be field or, or lab experiments. Um, and so all of these are ways to get students involved in uh, active learning processes related to ecological concepts. So either, you know, dealing with, with data that's already been collected, dealing with figures um, from the primary literature, or doing these experiments themselves. Um, and so um, these resources have been developed over over the years, we continue to accept um, new um, submissions of all three types. Um, and as George indicated, one of our uh, hopes over um, the next year is to further refine um, 
our templates and how um, how folks submit resources, um, these activities to further incorporate for DEE. And so one way of, of helping us think about that is to look at some of those that have been published recently um, and think about how they might be tweaked a little bit um, to incorporate more of that for DEE. Um, and so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark now, let him uh, introduce his, um, uh, his experiment that he published. Um, I will uh, put a PDF of that uh, in the chat so people can look at it. Um, and then after Mark talks, we'll probably break out into some breakout rooms and have folks sort of brainstorm or think about you know, what aspects of 4DEE were captured by um, this experiment and what are some possible tweaks that could be done to it um, to uh, capture more of that framework. So um, with that, let me stop my share um, and turn it over to Mark. He's got a few slides to introduce this, um, his experiment to you. Good afternoon, everybody. All right. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the lesson plan that I developed and published in, in Thai uh, last year. Um, this was developed while I was teaching at uh, Heidelberg University in Ohio. Um, and then I think after that, uh, as Chris mentioned, the goal today is to discuss how the activity can be improved to better incorporate for DEE and then I think finally to brainstorm and discuss ideas for some of your own activities. So the title of the activity that I'm highlighting today is um, Leave It Alone, Are Falling Leaves a Burden or an Economic and Ecological Windfall? So um, just as a caveat here, this activity was originally developed for an introductory environmental science course, um, but of course could be applied or adapted um, for other courses. So the principle, um, and these are just basically screenshots of the, the file that you would see in um, on uh, the Thai website. Um, so hopefully you'll become more familiar with how the journal um, publishes. So the principal ecological questions addressed are how much nitrogen is cycled back to the ground through leaf fall? And is it environmentally and economically sustainable to collect leaves from a lawn in the fall? So in other words, how much does it cost to replace the nitrogen contained in leaves if they're removed from a lawn? So to address these ecological questions, students build and deploy litter fall traps. They collect and dry the, co the collected leaves. They identify the tree species that they find based on the leaves. They weigh the leaves. And then based on nitrogen content information by tree species that they obtain from the scientific literature, they estimate the amount of nitrogen that is deposited in their sample area and extrapolate this to the relevant campus area. Um, they then take all this information and, uh, and use it to estimate the cost of replacing leaf fall nitrogen with nitrogen fertilizers, assuming the leaves are raked up and removed from the lawn. So um, just uh, in addition to getting students thinking about nutrient cycling, and how humans can influence the world around them, students should, upon completion of the activity, be able to demonstrate these, uh, these different um, techniques and objectives. So um, they should be able to demonstrate random sampling techniques, the use of technological resources, um, so GIS applications, scientific literature databases. So we just used um, simply Google Earth and Google Scholar for that. Um, they should also have an understanding of common tree species and basic tree identification techniques. Um, and also they should have the ability to perform calculations and um, you know, relatively simple unit conversions. Uh, and with that, I, that's you know, a very quick um, synopsis of it. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, but I'll uh, you know, open it up, I think at this point, right? Right, Chris, is that the, and George, that's the goal? Yeah, so um, I have put three questions in the chat um, that I 
in a minute here, we'll divide up into sort of smaller breakout rooms um, to, since we have a group of 31. Um, so smaller breakout rooms to have people um, have an opportunity to participate in chat. Um, but, uh, you know, based on that background, and you can go to the link that I shared, um, you know, what are the dimensions of 4DEE that are included in the experiment? Um, what are the dimensions that are missing? And how might this experiment be modified or enhanced to incorporate more dimensions of 4DEE? Um, and, and please tear it apart. Sorry to interrupt. Please tear it apart. I'm really looking for, for input. Um, I would appreciate that. So, right. <laughs> thank you. Um, and then, you know, um, if it, if you um, are super speedy and blow through that, you can share with one another um, activities that you do um, that you think capture uh, 4DEE um, or maybe bounce ideas off of one another about um, potential future submissions to um, TAI that incorporate uh, this, this 4DEE framework. Um, so, um, so um, before we head off to um, breakout rooms, Mark, it looks like uh, Bruce had one question for you, which is whether you um, asked for any written responses to any questions about whether students think leaf raking is, um, leaf raking and throwing them out is a good idea. Um, sort of oh. at, at the beginning, before they do the activity, you know, before they do the experiment at all. I, Assume that's what you mean by pre, um, Bruce. Yes. Um, so that was definitely incorporated into the the early discussion, and then we bring that back at the end. Um, and I have some sort of additional follow up questions that include, you know, what you do with um, when you cut the grass, what you do with the the blades of grass that you're cutting, or you're clipping, and are you removing those? And then, of course, that opens up other conversations about how we're interacting with our lawns. So yeah. does that answer your question, Bruce? Yeah. Right. Anybody else have any quick questions about um, how Mark used the activity or about the activity before maybe Jessica can divide us up into some breakout rooms and we go there for about 15 minutes or so and then we come back together and share some ideas. I'm not seeing any hands raised, but I'm sure we'll get some questions once people go into the breakout room. So just as a reminder, um, Chris, I just copied and pasted your questions again into the chat box. So when you go into breakout rooms, these are the questions everybody should be asking. Um, and if you're not familiar with the 4DE framework, I'm also gonna tack in the website again so that you can reference that when you're having your discussion. Um, and I tried to make sure no 4DEE connoisseurs were in the same room together so that we could spread the wealth a little bit. So I'm gonna open the rooms now and you're welcome to join, but if you have a question, you can pop back in. I can try to answer as best as I can and uh, we can go from there. Okay, have fun everyone. We'll see you okay, in thanks, 15 Jessica. minutes. We were so, the same, but we, we got everybody to share. That was important and, and the fact that you know, we have been doing some of the Ewing Dimension discussion, but not intentional, as intentional as 4D would like us to now to consider. And that was part of our discussion. So Car Carmen, from your, your group's discussion um, and, you know, Mark, Mark's submission in particular, Mark's publication in particular, are there ways that you know your breakout room thought that you know something that could be added to it to um, more fully address that that aspect of 4DEE the human dimension part well part of it is that we have to tell our students why we're doing what we you know why are we considering this question and in an intentional way so that they realize that humans I not only have an impact, but are part of the, you know, ecosystem that we're studying without having, without even thinking about all the impact on economical impact from, of doing this. And, but all of us have been having students do sampling techniques and having students consider 
um, you know, these kinds of questions without giving them the further human understanding that we're raising now. So it's, it's the intentionality that's hard to do. And, you know, all of us considered it from different, you know, the, the, this example of Thai uh, research uh, connected to everybody in the group, including me, because I've done leaf litter research, but we never, when we were doing it, we weren't doing it from the point of view as of the four dimensions. Did other groups delve into that um, human dimension part with respect to this particular exercise or were the emphasis on other aspects of 4DEE? Um, can I jump in really quick? So this is Ching Yu um, from VCU. So I can kind of see this is very, you know, applicable for students, especially they're interested in ecology, environmental science. Um, when I start teaching in VCU, my issue is I teach ecology, which is 300 C. And they have a lab, but the lab is optional. So the problem is for the large lectures, for the larger university like this, most of the students want to go to pre-med. So they, they come in with a lot of concept is this is required, I'm just go, gonna have to take it, but I don't need it. So mm -hmm. I feel like at the first few years I have been str struggled trying to battle, change their mindsets. You're gonna need ecology, even you are gonna be a doctor because infectious disease, climate change is all impact human. And I feel like, you know, for large lectures, we won't be able to do the experiment like that, but it's very important to incorporate those case study into even for the large lecture. Um, the one examples I use is when we talk about life history traits, we always say, oh, you know, we have like a spectrum, fast and slow or R type, or K type. But I incorporate a story using like a grandma theory to kind of explain how life history trait could change mm -hmm. and along the evolution. And you kind of just see the students start changing, like, like make them to see the connection. So I think like Carmen mentioned, you know, very intentionally tell students how to make that connect connection and we need to make it know this is how you make that connection and usually even a student, they are not majoring in ecology, environmental science, so they will change their view. And that's, yeah. And then I think our mm -hmm. group also kind of talk a little bit about how to kind of link to human, like how our daily life a little bit. And, and with a large group of 300 people, if if they're willing to share their potential career plans, you know, you know where they, they, then you can take any ecology experiment, let's say, you know, being myself, you know, terribly uh, allergic to molds uh, and as well as pollen, uh, I can, you know, say, well, why don't you, all the people who want to go into, um, you know, medical or health careers, you look up leaf litter molds and all the possible issues they cause on people and connect that to this research. You know, is it good to get rid of leaves or not? Are there other aspects of this particular exercise in relation to 4DEE that um, captured the attention of particular groups? Did anybody consider the, the fourth dimension? That's the other one. We, the human dimension, we tend to think about it, but we don't think about the fourth. How does this fit into the whole context of, you know, structure and function and all the, you know, evolution, all the other concepts in biology we think about? Our group tied a lot of the different pieces together into additional activities that could be done and built on. Um, and some systems thinking about what, where does nitrogen fertilizer might go, whether that's into the river system and down to the Mississippi and then connect with that or to a local pond. 
we also discussed the leaf litter. That was other people in my group. And we also discussed having the, the, one of the facilities pre people come on, come to class and, and uh, talk about what actually they do and what the costs are so that they could create a context for that and what the changes might be and discuss maybe the, how the changes might be working with a soil scientist who might do some experiments with the, in some patches with and without leaf litter. Um, I can let other people add. So we, we added a lot of different elements, water, uh, mulching and water. That was because I live in the West. So I added that, you know, leaving the leaf litter there is gonna actually help with some of our water management. Um, so anyway, I, that was other people in my group can add today. We tried to tie it to a lot of different systems level kinds of things to connect the class much more broadly across several, all four uh, categories. I'll just pipe in that we were um, also looking at it in terms of things like policy. So uh, like, or if you had an environmental economics course or something where the students could, uh, you know, do a cost benefit analysis with the different scenarios with letting the leaves fall or removing the leaves. And also like even doing an uh, opinions and attitude survey. So finding, you know, uh, in order to try to see if, you know, is this a potential policy change on campus and is it supported? So I, we decided that there's like no limit to this particular exercise how, you know, how much you could have different class, different student groups in a class, work on different aspects of it, or even bring it down, you know, year after year, continue to build on it. So you could just take this and spend the rest of your time um, at your institution working on it, I think. Benny, did you have something you wanted to share? Yes. Uh... In our group, we consider as a possible force dimension the study of the composition of the leaf as a way to you know, relate with transfer, transfer of energy and mass uh, in different in different environments, in different, you know, it's not the same in a dry uh, climate or more wet or depending on the soil biodiversity so that is a uh, probably i we 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 discuss if this is an extension or a cross cutting we are not we were not sure what to say about that and the other uh, and another dimension would be uh, you know uh, the difference in geography because for example this is more or less designed for a temporary zone where you have fall uh, well, here I, uh, I work in Puerto Rico. Uh, here, well, we have to distinguish trees, but during the dry season, not the fall, but the dry season from January to March, for example. Uh, so that's another, and um, there is uh, at Morris from uh, Zimbabwe, and they, they, in Africa, they have uh, other species, other uh, seasonality. So, that's another probably extension or cross cutting. Really, I don't know what's the difference. Great. So, uh, so as um, as the as the lead editor of Taya, actually, I have a more sort of practical question, right? So, you all have come up with fantastic ways to extend what um, you know what Mark has done here, right? Um, and, you know, in our group, we had this discussion that um, the degree to which this particular exercise really captured for DEE um, really depended on the instructor, right, and how the instructor implemented it in their class. Um, so that, you know, I guess my question is, um, are there ways are there things that we should expect of authors of, you know, Thai exercises, whether they're experiments or data sets or figure sets going forward to, you know, better enable instructors to do this? Um, and if so, what would that look like? 
right? You know, so, um, you know, I said, you know, this is sort of an ecosystem ecology um, you know, type of experiment, but I'm an evolutionary ecologist. I know nothing about nutrient cycling except, you know, or very little, right? And if I were to implement this, you know, what scaffolding would have to be there for me as an instructor? Mm -hmm. or, you know, I think a lot of us, or at least some of us struggle with that human, you know, human dimension. And, uh, you know, people came up with some really good ideas. Um, but what are ways that we could um, facilitate that for instructors or um, rather than, you know, leaving it up to their creativity to, to figure it out? I think one really good example is um, the cemetery demography um, project that came out of TAE where people put up data sets from their regions. And so groups can compare their results from regions across the, the world. Um, and having a, a common format is really helpful for that comparison. So something like that would, would really help with something like, and this is a great example that would work really well for that. So having a framework where, you know, people could contribute their data mm -hmm. um, yep. that they've, they've collected from a particular experiment. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, suggestions? <laughs> Related to that, then, you know, some of these ideas of extending the activity, we, multiple directions, people could write those ideas up. And so people could decide which of those they want to do, including some of the background ecology or e economics or other principles that might be soil science that might be helpful so that someone feels like they could bring that in. Um, so perhaps thinking about ways that, um, you know, the, the community could offer, you know, extensions or modifications of existing, um, you know, existing tie activities or published tie activities to, um, you know, to capture more of that framework. And, you know, what would that look like? It's an it's a interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Other Thoughts or suggestions? It's possible. Like just just a quick then that there are we already have a 4D um, website and maybe the response this these suggestions can be collected in um, as ways of you know modifying TIE in some you know uh, short blog uh, type of in um, posting. Bruce, were you going to say something? Well, I was just going to say, you know, that, I mean, the original submission that got sacked um, in, I don't know what year it was, 2000, uh, had um, live sites, hosted repositories that, that people would do activities, upload data, download data, compare data, like the cemetery activity. Well, NSF wasn't going to fund that at the time. And so, you know, we, we, uh, we, we cut the wagons and ran. Anyway, so... Um, but that's, I think it's a, it's a possible live idea. And, uh, and I know, um, you know, George and I have been working on something others, you know, might want to be involved. I don't know. I mean, you know, this is a good opportunity to do the right thing here. I, I would also add just to remind people, and I think Chris probably said something earlier, but I hope um, it sunk in. A lot of this the effort that you might want to do and put into publishing Thai, um is of great benefit to yourself as well, because it counts as a peer reviewed publication. Um, so don't think that you're just gonna write something and it's gonna be accepted. No, Chris is gonna rip it up and send it back and send it out for a review. But when it finally goes up and, and gets online, it's peer reviewed. So it's, um, it's gone through the ringer. Oh, and I suspect, and I don't know, but I've encouraged Chris to consider if somebody does some substantial work to an existing tie, you ought to get some credit for that too. I see Chris yeah. nodding. Yes, certainly.
I have a question on, on um, just in general, how far do you go with the just intellectual property on this? I mean, we're, we're here talking about um, pertinent sharing of our lesson plans. And I think that um, right off the bat, my, my concern would be intellectual property um, just because that um, uh, Mr. McLaughlin there shared his aspects about um, what he just stated earlier. So that would be one that's right off the top of my head would be intellectual property um, for my own, for my own um, well-being and my input. Then another thing that I wanna bring up also is the concept of demo, demos of lesson plans. Um, like for example, Chris, you brought up a good point about yourself that your, your aspect of study is what it is. And each and every one of us has an aspect of study in, in the area that we have studied and got our degrees in. However, when concepts like issues such as these are put at the table and we have an opportunity to share, we start backing off. For example, intellectual property, okay? Right now, as educators, I think we, we really need to start coming to the table and working on behalf of our ecology society and make that statement stating that every aspect of study pertains to ecology. Every aspect of study and mathematic, college of mathematic pertains to ecology. There is a circle here. There is a realm. There is no separation. And that's, that's my point of research when I do biogeochemistry. The other day I was writing, I, I was asked to do an intro about myself and what my study is. And I put biogeochemistry. Well, what do you know? The, the encyclopedia in the internet rejected biogeochemistry. So just to, just to correct the technology that is out there that doesn't, that is not uptaking this biogeochemistry spelling, I included, hey, that's a new, that's a new idea. So let's take it as an innovation. So we all today have something on our hand that we all become innovators, even though we may be a group talking about society of ecology. And I think we need to broaden our horizons and, and see everything with an open mind about some of these lesson plans. And back to the lesson plans is putting out the demo there, even though it, if it, it might not be in your line of work, you know, submit, understand it, Re do some research in that area. So you are, you become aware of the concept of each of us sharing that demo lessons. Like Susie might input her lesson plan from her perspective. Ching Yu might do her concept. Linda, Danny, Anne, John, Jessica, Bruce, Chris Beck, Elise, myself. I say this because we are diverse and I see in our, on our screen here, we are very diverse. We have all different experience. For that reason, we want diverse. We want new ideas. Therefore, I think if it's possible to start submitting new lesson plans. I don't know how long you you all have been sitting on moving from level one to level two to level four to level five. 
we need to be on it because we're still talking about issues that are 40 years ago. I come from a place that still deals with issue from 60 years ago. I have to deal with a waste dump in my backyard that came off of World War II's waste, okay? So that's why I'm really upfront today and seeing, sharing my aspect and my idea with you. And um, if we can start with intellectual property for a start for our group, let's be the one to do that. Let's, we have to have insurance. We all know that. And that's, that is a spot to start. And I, and the reason why I know about this is I do this on behalf of my people, on behalf of the children to our preschools, all the way to high schoolers. The parents sign up on, on, off on an intellectual property. Yeah. If it's a preschool that does her work for the whole year, that preschooler has a published book about her. And I think that is awesome. And that's a direction that I feel even us as educators, PhD holders, masters, we should have already done this. We should have already been there. We're still talking about old issues from the 1800s, 1900s. And I think that way in our, in today, if we should have done so on behalf of our youngsters, our families, then we would be in a better position today. We wouldn't be talking about recycling. We wouldn't be talking about issues, problems with our environment, our species dying out. So just wanna share that with you and let's, let's get on the ball here and let's start moving as an ecological society and, yeah. and, and plan it out, get this intellectual property going for ourselves. If yeah. we're gonna be the first group of people to get that going for ourselves, let's have it. And you, each one of us is gonna own it. And then we won't have to worry about sharing our aspects, what we want for our future environment our children and our family and our communities. It's everything. It's everything. And I and I know that's why I'm here today. Yeah. Just want to share that with you. Um just Christine, thank you so yeah. much for sharing. And and I, I have to say that that's one of the reasons what what you just articulated is one of the reasons that prompted the development of 4DEE and the incorporation of that human environment interaction to recognize that um, we don't all live in the same environment. We are affected by the environment in different ways. And in large part, um, it depends on who we are um, and where we live. And one of, the, one of the, the, the fundamental pieces, at least from my perspective, um, I teach at a historically, I taught, I'm retired, but I taught at historically black college and university and for 40 years. And one of the things that I soon recognized was that the environment in which my students grew up and in which they lived was very, very different from the one in which I grew up and the one in which I live. And so, yes. so it, to me, their ecology was not my ecology, or should I better say it as my ecology yes. was not theirs. And it, it demanded of me, not only that recognition, but it demanded that I teach ecology in a way that resonated for them um, in their environment. And so that's why the, Charlie and I developed the Crosstown Walk to look at urban ecology, to look at issues that affect people who live in cities because the city is an, eco is an ecological system. It's just very different from the one that ecologists traditionally studied in remote and removed places. And so, so the whole idea of 4DEE, Christine, is to um, not just enable ecologists to um, consider what you just discussed, but to, in, in some way, shape, or form, um, make them consider that, to 
to reframe what they do and frame what they do in ways that resonate with the students and student populations. And I will also, I, I'll say one more thing and then I'm gonna close because I have to go. But the other thing that I, I think is really critically important here is that the generation of students that we're teaching now, they're not, th their concerns are not the concerns that I had when I was growing up. I didn't think about the world ending and species going extinct at the rates that, they, you know, that just wasn't part of my framework. But my daughter, who's 26 um, this weekend, her perception of the environment and the future is so different from mine. And we need to consider that when we teach as well. And with that one, that last note, I'll stop. And I wanna, again, thank you all for um, coming today. It's been a, a truly great um, experience and thanks again for coming. And I look to see you all at 4DEE events in the fall. Have a great, great summer and uh, enjoy the time off while you can. Yeah, we're over time, but I was going to say the same thing. George, Chris, Mark, thank you all for uh, taking Friday afternoon or evening out of your busy schedules to have this very important conversation. And uh, everybody's participation is equally important. Chris, did you want to say something? I'm sorry, did I interrupt? I, I was just going to say thank you all for coming. Um, if you have even the germ of an idea of a submission to Ty, mm -hmm. um, send me an email and um, let me know what you're thinking about. All right, bravo. Bye folks. Right. Thanks Take everyone. Care.